Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Ross Virginia. Um, I'm a faculty member in the Environmental Studies Program. It's also my great pleasure to direct the Institute of Arctic Studies, which is part of the Dickey Center here at Dartmouth College. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, Professor Stephanie Furman here from Barnard College, um, a, a very distinguished and active and, and uh, as you'll see, delightful member of the polar community. And it's a pleasure to be able to introduce her. Um, she's here today and also tomorrow to be promoting a series of discussions on campus about interdisciplinarity and the, the importance, the role of interdisciplinarity in discovery, but also the challenges behind interdisciplinary science. And she's been networking with different communities on campus to help us find a way, th a path through this to improve the way in which we approach, approach interdisciplinarity at Dartmouth College. Um, I think the way to see the communities that, that uh, Dr. Furman uh, touches is to look at the co-sponsors of this. Usually you put the co-sponsors last. I'm going to put them first, okay, so you can kind of see where we're coming from here. Um, the Dickey Center for International Understanding, which is the, sort of the policy-oriented center at the college. Institute of Arctic Studies, and you'll see obviously why up here. Um, the IGERT Polar Environmental Change Graduate Program. The NASA Space Grant Program for Graduate and Postdoc Women in Science and Engineering. We've got engineering in there and Dartmouth's undergraduate women in science program. Um, throughout her career, uh, Dr. Furman has been involved with researching the Arctic environment, undergraduate education, interdisciplinary curriculum development, interdisciplinary science, and reaching into the policy community and trying to develop strategies for sound management of the natural world. Um, her current interests include many different aspects of sea ice in the Arctic, and the ways in which we can better foster the development of women scientists and interdisciplinary scholars. Uh, Dr. Furman has a long history of overlapping titles and responsibilities. If you read her CV, you can, you can see them kind of weave in and out through her career, and I think that has to do with what drives her in the way that she connects people, networks fields, and makes advances in all of them. Um, she has ser served as president of the Council of Environmental Deans and Directors, She's currently co-PI on the NSF-sponsored Advancing Women in Sciences initiative at the Columbia Earth Institute. And she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences Polar Research Board, which is a very important group of people that advise the NSF on the cutting edge directions for polar science. Um, so how did she get there? Well, uh, Dr. Furman received her PhD in marine geology and geophysics from the MIT Woods Hole Joint Program in Oceanography and Oceanographic Engineering. So she was already bridging fields early on in her, her graduate training. Um, she came to that from a, a training in geology at Colgate. Um, when she f left graduate school, um, perhaps rather than jumping straight into a traditional academic track, um, she served as a U.S. Congressional Committee staffer where she worked on a variety of issues, including arid lands agriculture, right, and, and uh, other aspects of uh, sustainable development. So she, she got her, her some grounding in, in, in the real world, if you will, in how we connect science to real human problems. Um, uh, she's currently the uh, um, Hirshhorn Professor in Environmental and Applied Sciences, and she's also chair of the Environmental Science uh, Department at Barnard College, and she's been there since uh, the early 90s. Um, now, if that isn't enough, in addition to all this work, she's also known uh, for her excellence in teaching. She's a very, very active instructor. And um, she's teaching courses on uh, polar science, uh, climate, energy resources, oceanography, all of this while she's doing this other great work in, in, in the academic community. Um, so it's been a real pleasure to have her here today. She's here tomorrow. She'll be meeting with Eigert students. She's been in the classroom. And she's, again, she's helping a number of different groups on campus, including uh, undergraduates in the Women in Science program, understand how one approaches a career in science and how one becomes successful at that. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Stephanie Fearman here today, and the title of her talk is The Last Arctic Sea Ice Refuge. Please join me in a joint welcome. For <laughs> So thank you very much, Ross, and thank you also for the invitation to come here today. Um, what I'll be talking about is um, the last Arctic sea ice refuge. And what I mean by that is that as we've been hearing about the diminishing ice in the Arctic, we've been focusing a lot on what's disappearing. And what I'll focus on here today 
is what might remain for longer, uh, where and why. And that will become the last Arctic sea ice refuge. My work with this is on with several collaborators. We've talked about interdisciplinarity, and so I've got a number of people who are working with me on this, this, um, this project, and they, they span both different disciplines, different countries, and different institutions. And it's through working with these other uh, colleagues that I've been able to um, put together some of the data and the analyses that I'll be showing here today. So this is the last Arctic sea ice refuge, and I'll explain why it's this area right here, um, but it's just north of Greenland and just north of the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. And what we're particularly interested in, in understanding is um, the sea ice that will remain here for how long and what's actually feeding it. And so I'm giving you a little bit of a taste of that right now because I'm going to walk you through to defining the refuge after coming from the current status, what are some projections for the future? What are some implications for the transition? So that you'll understand why we did the analyses we did in terms of trying to define what the refuge could be like. And then we'll look ahead and we'll actually use some of Ross uh, Virginia's uh, work in helping us to do that. So current status. Um, this is the, um, the last um, um, most recent update of the Arctic sea ice minimum and many of you have uh, probably seen something along these lines. You're aware of the trend that the Arctic sea ice is disappearing in summer. The um, reason why we take the September sea ice extent is because that's the minimum. After an entire summer of melting, you reach the, 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 um, the end point in, in September, that's when the minimum is, and then you start growing ice again in September and October. And the Arctic ice has been declining over the past um, several decades. And I first started doing my research up in the Arctic in, the early, in 1979, 1980, so right at the beginning of this record. And what you see is that there's a fairly, you know, sort of jagged response. Um, the ice has been um, oscillating quite a bit. Sometimes you have um, good years, sometimes you have bad years. But 2007 was really bad. So in 2007, we, we, um, it shattered all previous um, uh, low um, extents, and I still remember where I was when I saw the ice um, disappearing. I was preparing for a talk that I was going to give at NYU on September 11th, um, so it was September 11th, 2007, and NYU, if you know, is, is sort of, you know, within uh, very close proximity to the World Trade Center, and so that was, you know, quite a memorable event anyway, but when I took a look and I saw the ice extent, as you can see on this map here, with this huge bite taken out of it. Instead of filling the entire Arctic Ocean the way it usually does, it, was feel, it seemed to fill only half of it. I realized that something very different was happening. And for all of us, and Don Perovich is here in the audience, and for all of us who worked on the Arctic and saw this, we were really unnerved. I mean, we were shocked. We were really surprised that the ice had disappeared so quickly. Um, if we take a look at um, what's happening more recently, again, this is the January. I wanted to bring something up to date. And so you can see that, you know, the January uh, um, pattern is also in terms of the winter ice extent. It's oscillating. It's um, decreasing. And um, while there appears to be periodic recoveries, um, we're back again at one of uh, a very low um, periods in, in ice extent. So um, there's this, this um, oscillation in the winter time where you have this maximum ice extent in the, I, I'm sorry, in the Arctic where you have the maximum ice extent in winter and then you followed by the minimum in, in summer. And what it used to be is that we would have something on the order of um, 8 million square kilometers, and let me just go back to this, um, in the winter time, uh, in the summer time, and it would then recover to about twice that, about 15 million square kilometers in the winter. And the reason why you have the big increase in the winter time is because it's cold and it's dark. And that is still going to continue. And a, it's a lot of people don't realize when we talk about the disappearance of ice in the Arctic, what we're talking about is the rapid diminishing of the summer sea ice extent. Here you see that it's um, getting close to being, at least in 2007, to being half what it was um, several decades before. But in the winter time, we still have sea ice, and in the future, we are still going to be growing sea ice in the wintertime. You have ice forming on lakes and, and, um, and rivers here at, much, um, at latitudes that are much farther to the south, and so we're still going to see this pattern. And here's a satellite image showing the annual oscillation. It was starting in uh, 2003, and what you can see in gray is the sea ice, and you can see that it spreads out and it covers much of the Arctic. 
Um, and you can start to see some of the dynamic aspects of it, which I'll highlight more in, in the subsequent slide. You can see that the, um, I'll just run through that one more time. You can see that the, the Siberian shelves are, tend to be open in the summertime and then they fill with ice in the wintertime. Um, there t is somewhat of a, a gyre going like this. Um, a lot of the ice streams out here through, this is, this is called Fram Strait between Greenland and Svalbard and I'll come back to that in a minute. And you can see that the ice cover is moving, it's not static, and a lot of people don't realize that and they don't understand the implications of it. So let's take a closer look at just how it's moving and what the implications are. Up here you can see in this, this index map um, something that we, we published where we were looking at the, the sea of origin of the ice. So it's as if we dyed the coastline with these different colors and ice that's coming from the middle of the Siberian seas, for example, right here is this brick red color. And it tends to come uh, flow across the Arctic towards this passageway over here where we saw all that ice coming out in the previous um, slide. It's called Fram Strait. This is the North Pole for reference. Um, this ice here, um, uh, closer to Bering Strait, is coming straight across here. But this ice moves in this giant gyre. And that's what I'm going to be showing you here. Um, I'll show you the, uh, a time series of the ice origins in this um, um, panel. And in here, we'll be looking at ice age. And what you should look for uh, is, um, is when the central Arctic ice which you'll see in the center of this gyre. In 1989, it squirts out like toothpaste out of a tube right out through Fram Strait because the winds shift. And I'll point that out for you. So here you can see the ice origin on the right, and you start seeing this gyre develop. Here you can see the age of the ice. So in light green, it's the first year ice. And in gray, we have the very old ice. And here, 89, a lot of the gray ice disappears. It's kind of like a whoopee cushion, right, that the ice came out. And then after that, the ice cover is much younger um, and, um, and uh, you no longer have that plug of really old ice that was indicated here in gray. So what happened was that the winds aligned perfectly in 1989 to, to push the, a lot of the old ice out of the Arctic interior out towards the central, um, out through Fram Strait. So this old ice that had been circulating there for, for in some cases for 10 years, was pushed out of the Arctic. And that left the Arctic a lot more vulnerable to future warming and to um, other dynamical changes. So the, the reason why, one of the reasons why the Arctic ice is becoming much um, thinner and is diminishing in terms of ice extent much faster than we expected is because the, the ice cover itself is much more dynamic than we ever realized. It's not like, say, a puddle that freezes solid and then it just melts in place but you actually have the possibility for the ice to move and to flow and to, um, and to respond to changes in wind and other factors. There are other reasons why the ice uh, retreated much more quickly than, than we had um, anticipated. One is that the um, ocean currents changed at the same time, so you had warmer, warmer waters coming in through the Bering Strait as well as in through um, this region over here coming up out of the Atlantic, sort of the extension of the Gulf Stream. So there were several reasons why it happened. But the net result is that the extent is decreasing and also the thickness. Now, here you can see a, another depiction of Arctic sea ice age. Um, th this is similar to what I showed you before, but now it's shown in red that you have ice that's older than two years old is in the central part of the Arctic here. And that was the, the median value for 1981 to 2000. As of 2009, this is the only place that you have that really old ice. It's banked up right here, the area of the refuge, north of Greenland and north of the Canadian Ar Arctic Archipelago. The rest of the Arctic is now filled with ice that's less than one year old. So you've seen this dramatic decrease in the age of ice, which also results in a decrease in ice thickness. Just for reference, this is an older plot here that shows what the ice thickness used to be. So it was upwards of three meters. And, and then by 93 to 97, it had decreased to something less than two meters. So I'm 1.7 meters tall. And so you can think of it as being originally being twice my height and then decreasing um, to about my height in terms of thickness. So this is the status. This is what's been happening, is that the ice extent is decreasing at the same time that the thickness is. So what are our projections for the future? Um, we knew that the Arctic was going to warm. This is an old quote from the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, but it's, it's one that I like. 
because it talks about the Arctic and says that because of a variety of feedback mechanisms, the Arctic is likely to warm more severely than any other area on Earth. With, subsequent, um, with consequent effects on sea ice, permafrost, and hydrology. And you can see here in this, this depiction with two times CO2 that the Arctic was predicted to warm a lot. And in four times CO2, you know, you see um, the extent actually um, even more so in the Arctic as well as in the Antarctic. So we had expected this to happen, and it is in fact happening in this way. This is a, a, um, a plot showing the, um, the temperature running from 1880 to 2010, and it's a little confusing because it's looking at the anomaly, so, you know, the departure from the mean across the entire globe, and it's looking at it latitudinally from the southern hemisphere here up to the northern hemisphere to 90 degree north and the North Pole. And what it shows is that you had a period of warming, Arctic warming, that was um, in the 1930s or so, and then um, it cooled but now we're coming into this new phase where you have much more warming and it's a much more steady increase. So just as in this previous plot where we had expected that you would see an increase in warming in the Arctic uh, with um, um, acceleration or um, as the greenhouse gases, um, the warming due to them took hold, you would, you would expect to see this increase in the Arctic and we're in fact seeing this um, in the data right now. now we knew that this warming was going to have an effect on ice. And so the original projections from the I Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, were something along like this. So the, the ice was projected to decrease and it was being, pro being projected out through um, this century. And the idea was that we were going to have, um, you know, as, as we moved along, we were going to have continual reductions in the, the ice cover. But what's happened is actually much more dramatic. Here you can see it in red. So these are the observations. And um, I think the title of this article was, you know, sea ice decreases faster than forecast. So, you know, you take sort of the bad scenarios of, of how fast it's going to decrease and we're, we're off of that um, trend. If we do just sort of a, a, you know, an eyeball it, you know, where are we going? Um, Ross was asking me or some people were saying, so when are we going to have no ice at all? So, you know, you can t sort of look down here and we're coming into, you know, this, the next couple of decades, you know, is, is where we could be. But, um, but we're not sure how we're actually going to make this transition. Um, there were actually projections um, that in, in the data and in the models, there, some of them, and in fact, um, there was a re really nice paper by Marika Holland and others that analyzed the, the, the models. And what they found was that over 50% of the models um, had some kind of rapid transition, as you can see here, where instead of just this gradual decline, which is what m many of the IPCC models were showing, or the models that were used in the IPCC analysis were showing, instead of having this kind of gradual decline, you would have a sharp reduction. So when they first published this, a lot of people were, were asking, you know, could the ice um, decrease um, as rapidly as they were indicating? And <laughs> What, this was published in 2006, and then what happened in 2007? You know, pretty much along the lines of what they, of what they, um, they thought might happen. But what was interesting is um, at the very last uh, moment, they, they took out the plot at the bottom from, from the article that was um, published. And this is what um, really captured my attention, was that as the Arctic sea ice is declining, the, um, it's not going to decline equally everywhere. Um, you're going to have, um, because of the, way, the fact that the ice is dynamic, you're going to have some places that retain ice for much longer than others. And if, if, in fact, you take a look at these models, there's very few of them that go to actually zero sea ice. And um, I put this conservatively to th say that most models project greater than zero <laughs> kilometers squared of sea ice in September through the end of the century. And what's really interesting about them is as you look at the models, they're very consistent about where this last remaining sea ice will be. And it's always right here, north of Greenland and north of the Canadian Arctic, Arctic Archipelago. This is where we have the oldest ice right now. This is where we have the thickest ice right now. And looking out into the future, and perhaps for decades into the future, it looks like we may be able to retain ice cover in this one particular location. So 
we can start thinking about this. You know, um, why is the ice likely to re remain here? And then, if we really want to do something about protecting habitats, you know, how can we focus our energies to 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 take a um, to take um, um, to be cognizant of the fact that this is a special area and deserves special um, protection. So to answer the question why all the ice is um, collecting there, it's actually very basic. Um, most of the ice is drifting at the whim of the winds. Um, and uh, that's the, the main reason or uh, main driving force for where the ice goes. So if you um, take you know high pressure system over the Arctic, which is what I'm showing here, right? And you, you say, I'm going to drive you know, the winds um, and blow the ice um, in front of the winds with the Coriolis effect. It's going to blow all the ice up against the coast of um, North America and, um, and Greenland. And so that's going to be the place where the ice is going to accumulate. So with that in mind, um, you know, it's, it's a very robust finding across all the models, and it makes a lot of sense. And so we can think about this now in terms of what might happen um, in the future and how we can, um, how we can um, deal with the f this, um, this situation that you have a lot of ice, or not a lot of ice, you have some ice in one area, and what's that going to mean for, th for the uh, future of the Arctic and its ecosystems? So I'll turn now to start talking about implications for the transition. Um, so the, um, the change in uh, summer sea ice distribution, I'll take a look at this first. And what you can see now is I've kind of I've sketched this out and I've put you know, where the summer sea ice used to be very schematically in this oval here. And underneath it is a bathymetric map of the Arctic. So this is, you know, if we took all of the, um, all the sea ice off of the Ar out of the Arctic, um, and I'm sorry, and we took all the water out and we looked in to see what the topography was like. And what you can see in here is that the Arctic is, um, is an ocean, it's surrounded by continents, and the continental shelves are very shallow. They're in this light blue. But the central of the Arctic is very deep in the basin. So this would range from, say, 50 meters to, uh, in much, over much of the, um, the Russian shelves to um, 200 or so meters here. But the central Arctic is like 3,000 meters. So you're, you're going into you know, very different um, um, bathymetric conditions. You're basically, the Ar central Arctic is a basin. So as we withdraw the summer sea ice back towards where I had shown it as the Arctic ice refuge, the, the marginal ice zone, the edge of the ice, transitions from, instead of being over the continental shelves, it'll retreat back and it will be located over the central basin of the Arctic. Okay? And the reason why this is important is that the Arctic marginal ice zone is a zone of incredibly high productivity. It's where everything happens um, in terms of biological productivity. Within um, there's some, in some places, within two weeks of the spring bloom, you can have as much productivity as you have during the entire rest of the year. So what happens then in terms of food production, the algae and then the zooplankton that follow that and then the fish that follow that, um, it is what can form the base of the, um, the ecosystem up there. So let's take a look and see what could happen in the future. So if we have this, this scenario where we're still forming a lot of ice in the wintertime, and then the ice is retreating back in the summertime, let's take a look at, at sort of a, um, a transect across here and think about what the implications of this could be. So if we, take a, um, if we take a transect across the Arctic here and we take a look at it, so this is the Siberian shelf, which is something like 50 meters or so um, deep. And this is the sea ice. And in the past, what happened was that the sea ice would form on the, the continental shelves of Russia. And as you saw in those animations, it would form there, and then it would move across the central Arctic. The North Pole would be about here. And then this is Fram Strait, that area of east of Greenland, where the ice would be streaming out. So you would form the ice here. It would start moving across the Arctic, and it would grow by um, accretion at the bottom. So every winter, you'd have more ice that would be added to the underside. And at the surface, you would be melting. And by the time you got to Fram Strait or so and you hit the Atlantic water, which is warm, you would be melting the entire flow and you'd be reduce, releasing anything that accumulated in the ice in terms of biology um, or sediments or contaminants, which I'll get to in a minute. It, but it would deposit them on another continental shelf, the East Greenland shelf, which is also relatively shallow. So you're basically having a conveyor that was moving from one continental shelf 
all the way across, bypassing the central basin to another continental shelf. Now in the future, as ice starts melting um, more and more uh, during the summertime, it could be that what we have is that the conveyor is short-circuited. So you, ha you still have the same processes of winter ice formation on the continental shelves, but as the ice moves out to the central basin, it could be that all the material that's being transported by the ice and the marginal ice zone effects uh, are being dropped into the deep Arctic basin, right? So it's very different. Um, there's a huge benthic um, ecology that, that is um, b basically supported by this reign of detritus and productivity that's coming onto the continental shelves of East Greenland and the Barents Sea and also uh, the Beaufort Sea and um, Bering Sea on the other side of the Arctic. And all of that material, instead of being deposited on a shelf, is being deposited into the abyss. So when I say all of that material, just to help you visualize what that actually looks like, um, I'll show you a slide in just a minute. Um, one of the things that I just, I had this arrow in here to remind me, me is a, there's a big question about how fast the ice is going to move, okay? And so I'll come back to that later, you know. Will it, will it speed up and actually bypass the central basin again? Or will it, um, will the melting be so fast that it actually continues dumping it into the central Arctic? So let's take a look at this. But what, I took this picture here. This was a spring bloom on Spitsbergen Bank Bank and, and it was right here, right at the edge. This is a satellite image showing the, the surface chlorophyll, which is you know, the phytoplankton. And you can um, see that there's the sea ice flows here, and it's completely in this sort of pea soup of organic material. It was just extraordinary. I mean, you just looked at the water, and it was green. And it was full of, of diatoms and other um, org um, uh, um, phytoplankton that had grown within a very short period of time. And this, it grows so fast, and here you can see a schematic that indicates this. So as the sun comes up, what you're doing is you're, heat, you're having more sunlight so that the, the phytoplankton can grow. And then you have the zooplankton that come um, to eat the phytoplankton, and then you have the, the fish that are coming to, to feed on, on the whole um, system here. And what happens is that you have this very short window where you have the, the sun is coming up and it's fueling this, the, these phytoplankton. And so much is produced that the, the zooplankton can't possibly eat it all in time. So a lot of it sinks to the bottom. And that's what's feeding this benthic food chain. And here we have this shown schematically here. These are some of the, the very long uh, uh, diatom chains that you can see that sometimes form. This is a diver for scale. So, um, the Arctic can be really productive. And here's some of the shrimp-like organisms that also travel with it. But here you can see the drift ice um, that's, that's um, supporting this community and the marginal ice zone. And then you can see this entire food web that a lot of this is dependent on what's happening with the ice. And um, the, um, the bottom predators and the, the, bottom, the benthos is, is really an important um, aspect of the food chain. You cannot, the, the gray whales and the walrus can't possibly dive the 3,000 meters to catch the food if it goes into the abyss. So which species would be affected by this? Um, and this is from some work um, done by Ainley, Tynan, and Sterling. And um, they actually published uh, an article in, in 2000 and, uh, or 1997 that anticipated many of the changes that we're seeing here today. What they did, which, which I thought was really neat in this, this one article, is that they separated the ice obligate, that means on species that are really linked to the sea ice, that they need to be associated with it. From those that have evolved um, specific behavioral, behavioral or physiological adaptations that exploit the sea ice habitat but could potentially live elsewhere. And um, so we, because most people are interested in, um, in mammals, um, I'm focusing on that here. But we are very concerned about the entire uh, food chain. So I just want to use these as illustrative of some of the changes that might happen. So we'll take a look at some of these that are ice obligate and then also some of the ones that um, have, exp um, have experienced adaptation. Um, and what we'll be talking about are some of the direct effects due to the loss of the ice-associated habitat, but then also some of the indirect effects that might affect migration patterns or changes in nutritional status. Um, because um, this work has been, um, uh, many people have been thinking about you know, how the Arctic might change, there's actually quite a, um, an interesting um, um, sort of uh, 
population of uh, uh, cartoons and you know late night TV that have talked about things. I had one article that I published about the Arctic Ice Refuge, and Stephen Colbert said, you know, hey, polar bears, they're mean animals anyway, you know, um, let's get rid of them. But I just wanted to show one cartoon that I thought was particularly good because these are some of the species that I'll talk about. So what are we playing for tonight? How about survival of the species? Okay, who goes first, right? So, okay, so with that as background, we'll start with the birds, which are not on here. So let's take a look about what will happen to Arctic birds and how they're connected to the sea ice. So this, I, I, I love this uh, diagram for several reasons. Um, one is that it shows these incredible flyways that the, the birds um, take, you know, go, going, they, they um, go from the Antarctic all the way back up to the Arctic, and they're take it, taking advantage of this incredible blooms of productivity that happen at both poles. But what was really interesting about this was when I was looking for, you know, flyways of migratory birds, I found it in the bird flu literature. <laughs> So isn't it interesting that it's because of this extreme polar productivity that we have the problems with bird flu? Otherwise, the birds would not be transitioning through all these different countries, and we wouldn't have to worry about the spread of some of these things. So you know, what are the birds doing? So this is a, um, some pictures from, from northern Norway and from Svalbard, and what you can see is that a lot of the birds hang out on these, uh, these rocky um, cliffs, and called bird cliffs, and they are um, in these islands, and they're close to the marginal ice zone, so they can fly off and feed and then come back. And they, they're fit in terms of reproduction and, um, and taking care of their young. They're, they don't have the predators here. And you can just see the massive numbers of them that you often get up in the Arctic. So what's going to happen to these birds when the marginal ice zone and all of this productivity recedes far up to the north? You know, can they relocate? Can they go to other places or not? You know, are they too tied to their habitat here? But when their food source is so far away from where they are safe in terms of predation um, and in terms of nesting, that's going to cause a lot of stress on them. What will happen to walrus? Uh, this was one of the, um, the um, species that had adapted um, to, um, to having ice. And the way that it adapts, to, it feeds mainly on bivalves, and I'll show you just how it feeds here. This is a great underwater shot. You can see the walrus with his head down, and it's using its flippers to push away the mud because it's feeding on bivalves on the, on the sea floor. It has to eat a lot of bivalves. Um, and it does that by, by putting the, the, the shell between its um, jaw and sucking out the, the food, and then, of course, spitting out the shell. Um, and what they need to do is, is eat a lot of bivalves. And the way that they get to new feeding grounds is that they haul out on the ice, and then they drift to new feeding grounds, and then they slide in, right? The original sort of couch potato, right? Then they sort of slide in, and they, they feed, um, they go to, um, to the um, bot seabed, and then they eat some more. So their food is not tied to the ice. They're just using the ice as a convenience, as a con kind of conveyor to get from one place to the other. And it, um, this picture up above that um, shows all the uh, walrus um, sort of crowded onto this one flow, this was taken from the Pacific walrus side. And I know that they've been facing some problems. On the Atlantic side, Eric Bourne, a, a Dane who I've worked with in the past, he's studied walrus a lot. And he thinks that it could be that, that the walrus are OK, because their food source is you know, clams, and they like to be in like 20 meters water depth or so. And so they can haul out on land, and they can get out to the food. Um, it will deplete very quickly, though, um, if they you know, are not able to move around. And, um, but he thinks that maybe um, they'll, they'll be OK in the future. So this is one of those complexities that, that we're still trying to work out. Um, but the big question is, what will happen to polar bears? And what they feed on are seals, and um, what the seals uh, feed on are polar cod. So polar cod are this very elusive species that likes to live as in association with ice. Um, I was actually on an expedition one time where um, there was somebody who wanted to do um, pol study polar cod for his PhD thesis. And um, it was a two and a half month expedition. And two months into it, he hadn't caught a single polar cod. He tried everything, nets and fishing. And um, I was out sampling some sea ice, and I found a half-eaten one. And I brought it back as a joke, and he cried. And he had a party, and he put the, it in, you know, on the, you know, on the, um, on the sort of party table. He had the, the polar cod, you know, sort of preserved. And I think he only got like one other one on the whole trip. So they're very elusive, and they very much like to stay with the ice. 
Now, um, and seals um, eat those, and they um, also like to associate with the ice in terms of both feeding and also breeding. So the seals will, will um, dig, have a den in the snow and then the, um, uh, to have their young, and polar bears tend to come to find these very tiny breathing holes of the seals, and they're able to find those, break into them and so that they can feed. Um, the other thing is that polar bears like to hang out near the breathing holes of the, um, of the seals, and the seals have, have kept these open in the sea ice, and this is kind of like the um, uh, McDonald's of the North, um, 24 hours, um, it's open 24 hours. You can see all these tracks, all these polar bears coming in from all over because there's a breathing hole there, and they know that they can find seals there. So what our concern is, is that when the, when the ice disappears and as it's retreating, that the polar bears will not be able to find the seals. And they especially need to, to get to the seals during the spring, right after they come out of their own dens with their young. Um, they're very lean then, they've been fasting, and they need to, the young need food, and the adults need to, um, to kind of rebuild their nutri nutritional status. And so it's, it's, we're concerned about, you know, will they be able to find the food and will they be able to um, then survive uh, during the summer as, the, you know, we, they have less and less ice. So there was a really neat analysis that was done that actually looked into this. And um, they were looking at projected changes in optimal polar bear habitat. So assuming that the polar bears don't change the way that they, they feed uh, right now, what Looking at the 20, um, around 2050 or so, this was led by Derner et al., um, what would we expect to see in terms of habitat? And what they found is that in red are all the areas where you would have diminished habitat. And in blues, you would see the maintained habitat, or in some cases, potentially even increased habitat. And what you see is that over you know, most of the Arctic, almost all of it, you see the habitat disappearing. Um, and it's because of the loss of sea ice. But there is this one area right up here where you might see either um, maintained habitat or potentially even increased habitat. And the reason for the potential for increased is actually interesting because as the ice diminishes, this area here can actually become, um, the ice be can become more complicated. And seals like to have thinner ice so they can have the breathing hole through them. And you, the polar bears like to have the stability of the multi-year ice. So when you have a more complicated ice structure, instead of the, that massive plug of old ice that used to be kind of wedged up against this area, it can be that this actually becomes a, even a better place. So we'll come back to that in just a second, but I want to talk about a couple implications and then we'll look at changes. So um, I, I had shown this map here and I showed where, where the sea ice was diminishing by inference, you know, it was all these places where the, where the polar ha bear habitat was diminishing. And if we take a look at some of the geopolitical implications of this, and this is some of the work that, that Ross has actually been doing with this uh, workshop that they held here on security and the future of the Arctic and governance. Um, this is the Northwest Passage, is, is right through here. Um, this is the Northern Sea Route over here, and I love this title. Um, in 2007, right after the ice hit the minimum I talked about, it said, Northwest Passage now open for business um, because um, ships were able to pass through. Um, the next year, um, in 2008, in also in September, it was both routes around the Arctic are open at summer's end, and the national uh, U.S. National Ice Center said that this was the first recorded instance that both the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route were open at the same time. So um, it turns out that the, both of these passages are important. If you take a look at the, um, the other routes that shipping has as options, it's going through the Panama Canal or going through uh, this very uh, challenging part of the world um, where there's a lot of geopolitical concerns. And so if you can ship through the Northwest Passage or the Northern Sea Route, you can cut 40% of the time off the, um, the shipping that's required. And um, it's one of the ideas is that as the sea ice is diminishing, the habitat for, for many of the ecosystems will be, for many of the polar ecosystems will be diminishing, but there'll be other things, you know, it'll open up opportunities for other things like transportation and um, oil development and things like that. Now, one of the things that, um, people have started talking about with the fact that the ice is, is retreating faster than we thought is the possibility of a transpolar um, turnpike. 
it's, it's called in this case. And that's going straight from the Bering Sea across the pole and coming out um, in the same place, this Fram Strait between Greenland and Svalbard. And I've highlighted here that this cuts um, the time off even more than the Northwest Passage or the Northern Sea Route. So there's a, there's a lot of interest in this. And um, as Ross points out in the analysis that he did, though, it's going to become a very dynamic environment in the Arctic for quite a while. Um, it's not that we're going to go from you know, the sea ice that we have right now to, to no sea ice where you can just sail through without ice strengthened vessels. And that's some of the research that I'll show you in just a second. Um, Obviously, these changes have really affected you know, how um, countries are viewing the poles. So Russia actually planted a flag at the North Pole. And um, a lot of people said, oh, that's just a publicity stunt. But then a lot of other countries started thinking, hmm, you know, what kind of interest do we actually have up there as well? So this shows the, the extent of the EEZ, that's the exclusive economic zones, heading out um, 200 um, nautical miles um, from the coast. And that's basically the area that the countries can claim. And then you have this whole area in the Central Basin that is, you know, is um, much more open in terms of, um, of, of governance um, um, perspectives. So um, Canada um, had originally um, said that they were, um, or they, they had not said so much about the Arctic, uh, about the claim of the, of the Russians. But then the next thing you see are these, I love this, these are um, some images looking at um, polar of, at stereographic projections. So they're looking at the bathymetry, at the topography. So clearly, they're looking to see how far out does their land extend and wh where can they um, actually make claims. And then as, as um, Ross said in his report, you know, Canada is defending its political interests. For example, making vesicle notifications in the no Northwest Passage mandatory. So it's, it is explaining, it's, it is, um, um, making claims about what it can do in, or what, what it um, wants to take, um, um, not responsibility for, but what it wants, what it has within its Arctic interests. Now, what's driving a lot of this is the uh, resources that are potential resources in the Arctic. And this is a recent um, analysis that the USGS did where they start talking about the, the probability or the likelihood of, of oil and gas. And um, they mapped out quite a large area up here. Um, so um, we're not exactly sure how this is going to play out in the future. But if it does play out with the country starting to develop their, um, their Arctic um, territories, um, largely within their own EEZs, it doesn't mean that just because they're developing it within their sphere of influence that any impacts will stay there. And that's the dynamic aspects that I'm going to be getting to now. So there's a potential for accidents, for spills, for emissions coming off the continents, um, all getting involved into the sea ice. And then it will drift with, with wherever the sea ice goes. So let's take a look at that. Sea ice can be a conveyor. This is a, a snowman um, at the height of the Cold War, War in Siberia. So there was so much industrial um, contamination that was coming out, uh, lead, a lot of soot. <laughs> Um, that, that the snow was turned black um, in uh, Siberia. This, these contaminants were being emitted to the atmosphere and forming Arctic haze um, that spread across the Arctic. And you can see it here. And a lot of that fell out onto the surface of the ice. In this plot here, I'm not quite sure if you can see it, but we were actually tracking lead um, on the surface of the ice. And you can see just north of Norilsk, which is a big industrial complex, a lot of um, some samples that we had high lead concentrations, we backtracked to coming from the coast there. So sea ice can act as a conveyor um, for um, contaminants that are deposited on its surface. Um, it's not just pollution threats within the Arctic that we have to be concerned about. There's also the potential for global um, pollution making its way up there. This, these are many of the, the organochlorines um, are semi-volatile, and they cold trap their way up, just like in a chemistry experiment, where they go to the coldest area. So they volatize during warm temperatures, and then they move progressively towards the pole. And they, go to, they accumulate in the coldest areas. So because of um, accumulated burdens of, of many um, organochlorines, um, there are some um, hermaphroditic polar bear cubs that are being born. And people are linking it to endocrine disruption and other hormonal imbalances caused by the organochlorines. In this case, what we did was we took a look at where these, um, where these, if we backtrack the ice with the high PCB levels, where did it come from? And again, it backtracks close to the coast, right underneath the air shed that could be dumping materials onto the ice. 
So if we take all this into account, so we know the ice is moving, we know that there's the potential for, um, for pollution of the ice from both local and from global sources, what does that mean in terms of the refuge? So just to remind you, this is where the, the oldest ice is, this is where the, right now, um, this is where we're projected to retain ice for, for the longest into the future. And um, what we decided to do was instead of the forward trajectories, which we had done um, w in this analysis here, we did backward trajectories. So we took the border of the ice refuge and we said, where does this ice come from? And this was for 2006, 2007, 2008. And you can see that the ice originated along the Siberian coast and to some extent the Beaufort coast and before it circulated into here. Okay? So if you want to protect the ice in this region here, you have to consider the rest of the central Arctic, which is exactly where you have the potential for the contaminants coming in, the transpolar shipping routes um, could also be cutting right through there. Um, to, to make this um, more um, policy relevant, what we decided to do was instead of, uh, was to track where ice moves between different EEZs, so exclusive economic zones, that 200 nautical miles. And what you can see is that there's a lot of, of transport from one e EEZ into another. So for example, the Russian EEZ is this brick red and it's always encroaching into the Norwegian area and sometimes coming over into this region north of Greenland and, and Canada. Um, and um, you can see that, the I that it moves out in waves. That's every time you form ice in the winter time, it has the potential to incorporate material along the coast and then it moves across the coast and you see these sort of waves of, of ice that was formed each winter as you go across. So what we did was we, we actually decided to quantify the, um, the ice between the different EEZs and that's what we've done here. So we looked at ice that is forming in one EEZ but will be exported out of it because our thinking was that if you pollute the ice within your own EEZ and then it, re it melts in the same EEZ, you don't it doesn't result in international conflict. But if you pollute it in yours and it gets transported into somebody else's, then there could be um, concerns. So what just, these are the EEZs up here for reference. So what you see is that th this is um, um, showing ice the f in terms of formation. So you have these border effects or the edge effects. So this is ice that forms in the Canadian EEZ and is going to be transported into the American one. Okay, that's why the blob is, is, is sort of shaped in a funny way. This is ice that forms in the Greenland EEZ, but it's going to be transported into the Canadian. And what you see is the concentration of ice that's, that's um, being, or the, nu the number of flows, it's um, parcels of ice that are, um, are in this category. So you can see that there's a potential right here. This is um, both coming from, from US into Russia and to some degree from Russia into the US. As, uh, it's going back and forth here. This area right here, this border between Russia and Norway, a lot of this ice here is moving into the Norwegian waters as I had pointed out before. So if you take a look, um, this was 79 to 88 and then 99 to 2008, there have been some differences and in fact the number of flows that formed has increased or the number of ice parcels that formed and moved has increased by 18 percent. So that means that the ice is becoming much more dynamic. We're calling this ice alien ice um, because um, it's ice that is formed in one EEC but it's moving into some other country so it's kind of like aliens. I live with a resident alien so I, I thought that this sort of is an interesting term. But anyway, so this is where that ice melts. So the one case was where it's forming. The other one when it melts is when it's likely to release its, its most of its contaminant load. And you can see here again that the, the, this area right here is, is potential for contention or difficulty in this area over here as well, okay, where you're having a lot of ice coming out and melting in the East Greenland area and you're having a lot of ice coming from Russia and moving over here. What was particularly interesting in this plot is if you look at the difference between these two, you can see that this area right here is showing up as kind of a hot spot where you have a lot of ice melting, much more so in the most recent decade than before. And in fact, the number of flows that are melting outside of the EEZ where they form has increased by 30 percent. The reason for this is what we talked about before, which is that if you take a look at the um, at the amount of ice that, that is um, at the seasonal ice zone, so the amount of ice that, uh, the, the area that's affected by ice at some point during um, the, um, the winter to summer transition, but is free of ice in summer, but has ice in winter, it's, it's expanding because the ice edge is retreating back. So in 2007, we had a huge seasonal ice zone 
whereas in the past, um, the ice zone was much more confined to the, the peripheral areas. So it's not surprising that we're seeing a lot more ice melting um, now outside of the EEZ where it formed because we're having ice melting back farther. Um, I'll just skip this one. So, um, so that's talking about um, transport between the different EEZs. The other thing that's interesting, just to get some chemistry into this, is um, you can retain contaminants with ice for longer when the contaminants associate with, with sediments. Um, you know, otherwise, if, if they're volatiles or if they're associated with water, they can run off when they melt. But when you have sediments, then the, the contaminants are likely to be retained with the ice. So what we did in this analysis is we said, okay, where are you going to get sediments in the ice? And it turns out it's where you have water depths less than 50 meters because during, in, in water depths less than 50 meters, you can have winter storms that actually resuspend sediments on the shelves, make the ice dirty, um, and when it forms, because the water is dirty, it has a lot of sediments in it. So we're looking now at the, the ice that's formed in less than 50 meters water depth, because this is likely to, to retain the sediments. And again, you see these waves, these pulses of sediment, potentially sediment-laden ice as it moves across the Arctic. And every once in a while, you can see a little bit of ice that moves over into this region over here. But most of it is coming out through the Arctic in this, the early part of this time series. We're now at 1996, 97, and we can start looking. There's a little bit more that comes over here, and we'll just keep watching um, through the time series. Um, when you get close to 2005, 2007, look at the gaps. They're widening because a lot of the, there you go. So a lot of the ice that's formed in wintertime is doing this, what we said in the early cartoon, where it's making its way partly across the Arctic, but then it's releasing, it's melting and releasing its entire load over the central part of it. But look at this here, the transition. So we said that as the ice cover diminishes and as you've lost this plug of old thick ice in this area here, you're likely to have a much more complex ice environment. And what we've shown is that the ice from the Siberian coast is actually coming in here and, and contributing to the ice that's um, in this potential refuge area to a greater extent than it did before. So it's kind of, it seems counterintuitive that you're having greater transpolar transport um, um, over into this region during periods of, of decreased ice. So one of the reasons that could be causing this is a change in the ice um, velocity. Um, and that's what I'll be talking about now. So back in the early part of the time series, you had these waves of ice that was sediment-laden ice that were very closely spaced. But as we start moving into the 2005-6 and 6-7 time frame, this pulse of sediment-laden ice actually much of the ice ahead of it had, had melted. But here you see in one winter time, the ice that formed this ice here made it almost to the North Pole, which it would have taken several years to do before. Okay, so the ice is accelerating. And we're not the only ones to have observed this. This was another analysis that showed that there was an increase in the mean speed of sea ice. And our, um, and our analysis where we did a histogram um, looking at the, the, the the time it took to come from the Russian coast to the Canadian coast, it used to take, um, in the early part of uh, several decades ago, it took 4.2 4 years. It's now taking 3.8 years. So it's increased by about 8% in terms of speed um, transit time from one pole to the next. So the reason why this is important is that if we are going into this lighter ice environment and we're increasing the ice speed, the whole ice regime can become much more dynamic. Things that are injected in one part of the Arctic can move much more quickly across and get um, and affect other areas. And the sort of the physics, the background of this it, is not hard to understand. It's um, in the past, you know, as the winds were trying to move the ice, a lot of the energy was dissipated by hitting other flows. But if the ice can just move at the whim of the, um, of the wind, then it can be transported much faster um, and much more directly. So what does this mean for looking ahead? Um, now I'll come to the, um, the analysis that Ross had done, where they looked at, here at a conference at, at Dartmouth, where they looked at Arctic climate change and security policy. And I think, you know, I can't say it better than they did, that the rules that are, you know, controlling the shipping and the emissions and, and pollution and land use are weak, and the enforcement mechanisms up there are ina inadequate. We need a large ecosystem-based management regime. Um, to, um, to protect the integrity of the Arctic. And people have talked about different ways of doing this. You know, do you take the entire central Arctic? Um, do, how, how do you work with countries about their 
economic zones. And one of the big issues is going to be how do we balance uh, the national interests uh, and actions with the role of the international community. One thing that I've been thinking about, and this is um, an area that I'm just getting into, which is one of the reasons why I was really happy to be coming up here, is what are some of the, possi some of the possibilities? And I was wondering about the potential for world heritage sites. Um, if you take a look in this picture here, these are all the areas that are either protected now and in red you can see some of the ones that have a marine component to them. And there's not very many um, marine, protect, marine protected areas. But World Heritage Sites are the, um, it's the property of the state on whose territory the site is located, which makes sense given that this refuge is within the EEZ of both Canada and Greenland. But the preservation is in the interest of the international community. And then they talk about, you know, what are the criteria? And the criteria are it has to be, you know, of unique or international interest. It has to be, in some cases, the only um, ecosystem that rep represents, is, is represented, you know, globally. Um, but there aren't that many of them. If you, of the total 800 World Heritage Sites, there's only 31 of them are marine. Uh, but the Galapagos Islands and the Great Barrier Reef are two of them. So it seems to me that there's some analogs there. So um, to conclude, I think that it's, it's, um, it's really interesting to think about the future of the Arctic. You know, as the rest of the ice is diminishing, we, will, we are likely to retain ice cover in this one area here. But this ice cover is actually fed by ice that's forming elsewhere. So how can we best protect this last remaining Arctic sea ice refuge? I think that we need to have a sustained Arctic ocean and sea ice monitoring and projection strategy, and we also need to be thinking about managing this refuge on decades into the future. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about how the, the ice is growing from underneath and if the pollutants are coming, I guess I was envisioning them being aerial from Siberia. So how right. would that? Right. So it's a good point. So there's, there's two ways that the pollutants get in. One is dumped on from above, um, as I showed with the snowman and the lead and the PCBs. The other is with the sediments that are incorporated on the shelves. Um, so a lot of, I, I remember talking um, with a Russian colleague early on in um, my research up there when I started working on contaminants and he said, oh, the sea ice is great because it's cleaning our seas of contaminants. And I was like, yeah, right, where's it going, right? You know, so, so, um, so there are the two ways of, of, in, um, of incorporating the sediment, the in contaminants to begin with, either, you know, sediment, contaminated sediments on the shelves. Um, or coming in from the atmosphere. But what's even more important is that most contaminants are particle reactive. So if you have sediment-laden ice, then that, that will be, be like a sponge for contaminants. So once they're deposited from the atmosphere or from some other means, then they'll stick with the ice um, attached to the sediments. So there's um, a sort of a process aspect of it as well. For the World Heritage Sites that you showed, right. are any of those, do, they, uh, do any of those involve multiple countries? Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know about that. Um, one of the things that, that I think would be unique about this site is that it's, um, it's dynamic. You know, it's not fixed. So, um, so that, that is an interesting aspect, too. Um, and it would obviously have to be shared between um, Greenland and, and Canada as the, the prime protectors of it. But then, you know, people, uh, one of the reasons why we did the EEZ work was to try to sh show other countries what their responsibilities would be. You know, if something like this were to be put in place, they would have to understand that their actions can actually impact that. So that's another thing that I don't think would be the case with, say, the Galapagos or the Great Barrier Reef. So I, I think you're getting into some new territory in terms of international protection. Hi, um, I was wondering how old the data is on the depth of the ice. So at the, the beginning of the talk, you talked about like last 30 years. Right. 
when does that data set begin? So the, the one um, data set, uh, actually, maybe I could ask the expert on this. So Don, what would you say? Um, so there was the submarine data that was some of the original ice thickness work. Um, and um, let me just, I can scoot back to that to show you. And um, now we're, um, um, there we go. That was pretty good. So this was done um, 1958 to 76. This was kind of Cold War <laughs> um, uh, um, submarine underneath the Arctic ice work. And then that was being compared to 93 to 97. Since then, there's been a lot more activity up in the Arctic. And we've got a, a better handle on, on uh, what the ice thickness is. But in general, it was, it was a hard thing to, to do for a long time. You actually had to go up there and measure it. Because when you look down from above with either flights or satellites, you're just seeing the extent. Um, now we've gotten more sophisticated to be able to look at the freeboard, you know, how much is floating above the water, so you get a feeling for what's underneath it. But um, early on, there, there wasn't a lot more data, I don't think, than what was um, published here for comparison. Yeah. Did you want to add anything? No? I, yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, along those same lines, um, in I think it was 1977, there was a big shift in sort of Arctic climatology. And most of your records start just after that shift. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that shift and what we know about what was going on before that, and perhaps if we know why that happened or if that was, I mean, I, I think a big question is that, is that a global warming signal or is that a, just a shift in sort of the modes of what we understand in, in terms of Arctic climatology? Right. So there's there's a, um, I actually have a, let me see if I can find this. Yeah. So um, just putting this into perspective, even going back a little bit farther. So there is this time period in the uh, 30s um, where the Arctic was warmer um, as well. And um, that doesn't have the same signature as global warming. This is much, a much more pervasive um, warming effect that we're seeing right now. And, um, but it did have some, it's funny, if, if you read some of the, the literature back then, they were saying the same kinds of things that, as we're saying now in terms of the loss of ice and what, what could be happening. Um, then we went into this, this colder period sort of globally as we had a lot of um, emissions of sulfate due to industrialization. And so that was reflecting a lot of sunlight um, sort of from a planetary basis. And now what we think is that the global warming signal is, um, is coming back in here. Um, together with some things like the soot, um, which you had talked about as, as well, and um, um, absorbing some of the radiation. So there have been these natural oscillations um, that have happened, um, and to some extent moderated by anthropogenic. But what, what it basically, you, you can think of it as um, sort of your own health, you know, that you sort of cycle through periods of, of, you know, having colds and having flus and everything like this. And so that's kind of what's happening to, to the Arctic on a natural basis. But then if you add something really bad and debilitating that, <laughs> like say cancer on top of that, now what is it that killed you? And uh, Sorry, not you, but um, somebody in the end, is it, is it going to be the cancer or the pneumonia? You know, you're weakened because of, of, the, um, of the cancer that's this sort of progressive long-term trend. Um, the Pew, Pew, Pew Foundation recently had a report out trying to calculate the, the, the value of the ecosystem services provided by ICE. And I'm wondering, have you looked at the IPCC models and tried to determine just how long that last refuge might actually be there or what a stabilization point might be in the CO2 for ensuring that we still have some permanent ice that allows right. the polar bear and a few ice-dependent species maybe to hold on? Right. No, I, I haven't looked at that, but it's a good question because if you can have um, the species um, stay around for long enough, maybe we can turn it around in, with mitigation, right? Um, and uh, so we've been thinking about that. Um, and I've been looking back in the past for analogs. So there were other times when the Arctic was, was warmer, just going back, you know, thousands of years ago, too. Um, there was, a, um, or back to 100 and 25,000 years ago, there were some times when there was uh, quite extensive warming and melting in the Arctic. And I was looking to see, um, was there still ice in this location back then? Um, and for example, polar bears have been around for a million years. So they've withstood 
the variations that have come up to now the, the other, the previous interglacial periods. And it's, it's interesting because it looks like um, from um, sort of whale remains and that sort of thing that there was a marginal ice zone that was close by to that region. Um, and that means that there was much more open water than there has been historically. Um, but it doesn't mean that the ice was gone um, in the summertime, completely gone. And so it, it's going to be hard to, I think, to, to pin that down because it is an, a region that, you know, you can have movement in the location, you know, from, from year to year, and so it's not going to be um, that you can always, um, uh, like say if you had the perfect tracker of annual record of where you had, when you had ice, you still could have ice just a little bit to the west or the east, you know. So it, it's something to think about though and to look into, and the fact that, you know, the polar bears, I, I believe um, from the, my, um, my polar bear colleagues, they've said that they've been around for a million years, and so they have withstood changes in the past. Yeah, so but looking ahead, I don't know. I mean, in talking with, with people um, uh, like Jim Overland and others who are, have worked a lot on ice, he, his, his phrase I loved, he said, that ice is going to be hard to get rid of in the, even in the summertime because you will have the winds blowing it up, you know, blowing it up against the coast. It'll bank up there and it'll be fairly thick. And, you know, we have snow banks that last into May in the Adirondacks. So, you know, up in the Arctic, you could retain the ice up there for quite a while. What further research needs to be done to, or you feel needs to be done to better understand this last remaining ice? Is it going to be paleoclimate research, um, yeah. perhaps, or what other kind of studies need to happen? Right. So the paleoclimate research, I think, is really important to, to you know, um, to give an idea of what the resilience can be of, of this area. As I was saying, I was trying to look at some of these, you know, sediment cores and and um, um, records of um, of um, um, fossils in, in raised beaches and things like that. Um, so that, that'll be important. Other things that will be important is to think a little bit more about the dynamics of the ice. And I think the question I really have is about how, how the ice velocities will change. You know, will we have, you know, completely transarctic transport within a year? I, I'm not sure that it can actually move that fast, but if you can move it at least into the next uh, winter's pack, that's one thing. Uh, another thing is, and this is some research that um, is, we're just working on now, is um, remember I distinguished between the ice obligate and the ice adapted species. So if for polar bears, if you can retain a significant ice fraction through the spring when they're, when they're lean and hungry and they need to feed their young in themselves, if you can, if you can um, retain ice cover long enough, maybe they can fast over a couple of months in summer. You know, maybe they can get past that until. And so we were actually looking at the ice extents in, in, through models in May, and it's quite extensive, and you don't see the abrupt reductions that you're getting in the September cover. So, um, and that's something that we're, we're going to look now is May and then June and, and, and try to see just how long, you know, you, uh, into the future you can have significant ice that will potentially help the ice adapted species um, to bridge the gap. Now, for s many of the other ones that have to have the sea ice um, year round, that's going to be more obviously more problematic, except maybe they can sort of move towards the refuge and move back out. Um, but I think that's, that's another area of research is, you know, what will happen to the seasonal cycle. 